Hi there, folks. This is the uh, Algebra 1 Unit 11 review, and as always, I'm the amazing Mr. Jansen. So away we go. Uh, if we look at the first one, it's asking us to find the, the mean, median, and mode of this thing. Uh, so remember the mean, remember we add all these together and divide by how many we have. Uh, so if I uh, take my calculator and I add them all up and uh, divide by how many I have, which is uh, uh, 12, um, it looks like I get a 63.75. Uh, okay? But again, you're just adding them all up, divide by how many you have. Uh, the median, a uh, little bit more involved here um, in terms of what we have to actually write down and do. Uh, we have to put all these in order first. So I've got to write each of these down in order. So I've got the 53, then the 55, 57, 61. I've got three of those. 65, 67, 68, 71, 72, and 74. Okay. And then once I have these written down in order, I have to find the middle of the data. Well, what happens here is if I count to the middle, I've got, uh, if I start kind of marking these off on each end, if I take one off of each end and then another one off of each end and just work my way to the center. I think this is what most students prefer to do. What happens, I kind of end up with these two uh, tied for the middle. So I have to find out what's halfway in between those, or really I have to find the average of those two. And if I add those uh, two together and then divide by two, again, it's finding like the mean of those two. If I add them up and divide by two, it gives me a 63. So that's my median. Okay. <clears throat> the mode is the one that occurs the most often, and that's the 61. There's three of those. Uh, there's no other number that has that many uh, of, uh, of that value. And then the range, we always just take the biggest value, which in this case is the 74, minus the smallest value, which is the 53, and that gives us a, a 21. Okay. Uh, if I look at the next one, your last five goal scores are uh, 96, 102, 89, 87, and 80, uh, 93. Uh, the mean score needed to enter a tournament is 90. Uh, what must you get on your next round to equal this mean score? And so really it's just I'm finding the average. I'm finding the, the mean. So I do 96, sorry. Uh, 96 plus 102 uh, plus 89 plus 87 plus 93 plus whatever I get on my last one, which I'll call X. And then I have to divide by how many I have. Now, there's four uh, actual number scores here, but I want to know what my average is going to be after the sixth one. So including the X, I have six values here, and I want to equal that, that mean of 90. Okay. So what I have to do is here is I have to simplify a little bit. Uh, so I'm going to combine the like terms. That's going to give me a 467. And now to solve this thing, uh, I'm just going to multiply each side by 6. So I get rid of the 6 first. Whoops. So when I do that, uh, over on the first side, they cancel. So I'm left with a uh, 467 plus x equals a 540. And now I just have to finish solving for x. I'm going to subtract that uh, 467 from each side. And so I find out that the, the score I need to get uh, on this one is a 73. And remember, uh, if you don't know this, in, in golf, uh, low, the lower the score is, the better. Uh, so 73 might be pretty tough based on the, the, the first five scores. Okay. <clears throat> uh, this one asked me to create a stem and leaf plot of the data. Uh, so again, uh, I just kind of have to look through this and say, okay, the lowest value I have is the 54. So I'm, I know that in, ter in terms of this, I'm going to need a 5. Uh, I've got values in the 6 range, 7, uh, 8, and uh, 9. And so I kind of just go through and I identify all the ones that ha that start with a 5. Uh, really, it's just a 54, so I put a 4 down. And now I identify the ones that start with a 6. It looks like I've got these guys, um, and that's it. And I, again, when I list these, I have to list them in order. So the 61 would be listed as the 1, uh, then the 5, then the 8. And that stands for a 61, a 65, and a 68. Uh, then I have to identify the, the ones with 7. Uh, so I've got one here, one here. It uh, looks like that's it. So I've got the 6 and the 8. Again, make sure they're listed in order. Uh, then the ones with uh, an 8. I've got one here. Another one, another one. Uh, and it looks like it's just those three. So it's the 3, the 8, and the 9. And then what's left has got to be my 9s. 
Uh, so if I kind of go through and pick out the nines, I've got two uh, 90s, so two zeros, a 91, a 93, and a 96. And again, we just have to list those in order. Then the last thing I would do is I would put a key for this thing. I would say, hey, by the way, the, the 5 dash 4, uh, that equals a 54. So now I can interpret the rest of this thing and read the entire stem and leaf block. But again, make sure you have all the values listed. Make sure the, those values over there are listed um, in ascending order from least to greatest. Okay. The next one asked me to interpret the, uh, the stem and leaf plot. And so as I interpret this thing, um, it asked me for the median of group A. And so really, we're just going to kind of count from each end, uh, just like we did before. Uh, keep in mind, this is the smallest value and the largest value. And then as I'm counting up, I'm counting this way. See, that's like a 1 and then a 3. So I'm counting down. This would be a 32 and then the 30 to go with that guy. But again, you just have to be really careful as you kind of count from each end. And uh, as I do that, it looks like the one that's left is the 17 right there in the middle. And for many of you, uh, it may help just to actually write these out. So like if I really wanted to, I could just write out and say, okay, I've got a 1, a 3, a 7, and then it's a 13, especially on the ones that are written backwards, 16, 16, uh, 17, 23, 25, 27. Uh, it takes a little bit more work. Sorry, my 27 looks like a 77. That's no good. Uh, it takes a little more work to do this, but you're more likely to get the right answer uh, doing it this way. Uh, just taking a little bit more time and a little bit more care to kind of write this out. Okay, And now we should be able to work our way to the, the center and, and count uh, how many we have on each end. All right. Uh, the second one here, this one's a little bit easier. We're just asking for the range. So really I just need the lowest value and the highest value of group 1. So the highest value of group 1 is a 41. Let's switch back. The lowest value I have in group B is a uh, 1. So I'm going to take the biggest value minus the smallest value, and I end up with a 40. And that's it. Uh, this one, we want to create a uh, frequency table uh, from the data. Um, remember, when I'm doing a frequency table, it tells me to use intervals of 10. Really, counting the intervals is the thing that's a, a little bit problematic for students. The intervals of 10 makes sense here, especially if I'm talking about test scores. The lowest value I have is a 70. So uh, I'm going to do the scores in terms of the intervals, uh, and then I'm going to do the frequency of each of those, which is essentially me just counting up how many I have in that interval. Okay, So the first interval will go from 70 to 79. That's 10 values, Okay, because again, we have to count that, that, that zero. Like if you think of 71 through 79, we know that's nine values because 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. But then we also have to count that, that zero. All right, so that's 10 values. That's the, the place that students are typically going to make their mistakes. And then uh, the next 10 values would be 80 to 89. The next 10 values would be 90 to 99. Okay, And then just have to go through and count up. If I go through and look for everything that has a, a 7 in front of it, uh, looks like I've got a 1, uh, 2, 3, uh, 4 of them. So I drop a 4 down. And if you use tally marks here, you know that's okay. Um, typically we want to write it. Uh, just as numbers, it's easier to read. Uh, when I count up the ones that have eights, it uh, looks like 1, 2, 3, 4, uh, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11. And then the, the scores that start with a 9 uh, oh, for the 90s, uh, it's like I've got 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, uh, 7, 8. And so... Uh, now that I have all those values, I, I just kind of look at this thing and say, okay, now I'm going to do a, uh, uh, a frequency histogram. I'm going to put my scores off to one side. Got to go make sure I go at least up to 11. And then I put my intervals down here. And a lot of times when I write the intervals, I'll put them in a diagonal just to save a little space. You know, 80 to 89, uh, 90 to 99. I mean, if you have the room, you don't have to put them on angles like that. It's just a, a trick to save a little bit of space as we write these things. Um, but then I just uh, I draw a bar that goes as high as that thing needs to be. I guess I should label some of these over here. Uh, 
And so the, the first bar should uh, go up to the, the 4 mark. And uh, there shouldn't be any space between the bars. The next one goes up to the 11 mark. And the last one goes up to the 8 mark. And that's it. That's my, uh, my histogram. Okay. Uh, the next one, the uh, cumulative frequency table. Uh, really, I just copy the same frequency table down. So I'm going to start off with the same uh, set of values here. So I've got my score. And then I've got my frequency. But then I'm just going to add another column for the cumulative frequency, which is just a running tally of the frequencies I have. So here it's 70 to 79, 80 to 89. And again, I'm just copying down what I already have, 90 to 99. The 4, the 11, and the 8 don't change. But now I say, OK, right now I have a total of 4. So now 11 more brings me up to a total of 15. Um, 8 more brings me up to a total of 23. Okay, and so that's my cumulative frequency table. I'm just kind of bringing a, uh, um, a kind of a running tally to the to the mix here. All right, uh, and in this last one, it asked me to decide whether this thing is uniform, symmetric, or skew. When I look at the graph, uh, really, you can make an argument for either symmetric or skew here. Um, if you say skew, I would say it's skew. Um, and the reason for that, uh, I would say it's because uh, the majority of the values are shifted off to one side. We can see that uh, these values, like the, the high point, yeah, is in the center, but I've got a lot more values over on this end than I do over on this end. Okay, And so that would kind of make this thing skew. And so if you kind of uh, interpret it that way, um, you could also say uh, that it's symmetric. Um, and you can make the argument there. You could say, oh, the, the high point is in the middle here. Uh, so that kind of shows that it's symmetric and these are relatively close a four and an eight uh, probably not as close as we would like but you can make an argument either way so just have a written explanation of either one of those things okay uh, for this one identify the quartiles and inner quartile range uh, then create a box and whisker plot and so this one the first thing I need to do is I need to put all my data values down in order uh, and so again just be really careful as you're writing these down in order. It looks like the smallest value is the 132. Maybe I should have written all this out ahead of time. You'll just have to bear with me. And so as I write all these down, uh, 156. And this should be relatively easy to do for, for most of you. Um, really, the, the, this is also the place that we make the silliest mistakes because, you know, we just miss a number in there. Uh, put little marks uh, at each number as you um, write them down so you don't uh, miscount them. Okay. And so what we do is we kind of cut the data in half. If I, if I look at this thing and start uh, marking off from each end, or really, uh, I tend to just count them all up. I see there's 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17 data values, which means I need to have 8 on each side um, with 1 in the middle. So 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. So this guy is the one that's right smack dab in the middle. And I circle it because that is my actual median value. When I go to do the quartiles, I don't want to count that value um, uh, as I as I find those quartiles so now when I look at the quartiles again I don't count that median value so I just look at the first half and then the second half ignoring that value and I say okay there's eight values here so these two right here are tied for the middle all right which means the median of those I have to do the average I have to do 148 plus 149 divided by 2 that gives me a 148.5 so that's my first quartile Um, on the other end, I do the same thing. I say, okay, these two are tied for the middle, so I have to find the average of those two in order to get the, uh, the third quartile, and that's a 188.5. So that's my third quartile. And then the inner quartile range, remember I take the third quartile minus the first quartile, and so if I do the 188.5 minus the 148.5, uh, it gives me a 40. Okay, And that uh, inner quartile range will be important in the next problem as we kind of work our way through this thing. But now I just have to kind of set up my graph here. Uh, 
Uh, I'm going to start with 130, and I'm just going to go by uh, uh, by tens here. So that's 140, 150. Okay, and so that should be enough information here. I'm just going to start graphing the thing. Uh, the lowest value uh, down here at 132. And yeah, I got to estimate just a little bit. Uh, 148.5. <clears throat> 163 is right around here. Uh, 188.5 is right around there. And then the largest value, the 220, is actually right here. And so again, I just kind of connect these middle bars and then uh, connect the whiskers. And that's it. Okay, so there's my box and whisker plot. And we can kind of see how uh, spread out the data is when we look at that. Okay. Uh, the next one says, what would the highest value above need to be replaced with in order to be considered an outlier? Remember our rule for the outliers, we do 1.5 times the interquartile range. So the interquartile range is a 40. I have to do 1.5 times that. And that basically tells me how far away uh, from the, uh, the, the first and the third quartile I'm allowed to go before I'm into the kind of that outlier range. And so when I multiply these guys, um, that gives me a, a 60. And so basically that's telling me that like from the 148.5, I'm allowed to go down 60 before it's considered uh, an outlier. And from the, uh, the third quartile, the 188.5, I'm allowed to go up. Um, I should write it this way. Let's see, the 148.5, so I can go down 60. And uh, over here, I can go up 60. Well, if I go up 60, that drops me off at 248.5. Um, and that's really the one I'm concerned with. I, I mean, I could subtract the 60 and get this guy, but it really asks me just about the upper spot. So really, anything above that 148.5 is going to be considered an outlier. Okay? So that's going to be my answer. Uh, this one is uh, really a job for my calculator, and you have a factorial button on the calculator. You can use that here, um, or I can just look at this and say, well, 5 factorial just means I start with a 5 and I count down. So it's 5 times 4 times 3 times 2 times 1, which is 120. That's it. Uh, this guy, this is a job for my calculator. Remember, uh, depending on your specific model of calculator, you want to find that probability menu. In the probability menu, you should find a, a button that looks like this, N. Uh, combination R and you just type in a 7 then hit that N combination R button and then the 3 and then hit enter and it should tell you that this thing's a 35. Same thing with the permutation uh, you gotta kinda work your way into that probability menu on your calculator once you find that probability menu you should have an N permutation R button uh, and so we type this in we hit the 8 and then we hit that permutation button on the calculator and then the 3 and that should give us a, a 336. Okay, so again, let make sure you understand how to use the calculator on those. Uh, this one, how many ways can the starting lineup of seven athletes be announced? And so, if we're announcing them, kind of have to think about the situation. The situation is where we're trying to decide what order we're going to announce them in. And so here, we're going to say that order matters. So I'm going to use a permutation because we're trying to decide the order. And it's the permutation. Uh, there are seven athletes. And we're going to announce all seven of them, so it's the permutation of seven choose seven. And I hit the buttons on my calculator, and it gives me 5,040. The next one, a group of five students is chosen from a class of 20 students to participate in a committee. How many ways can the committee be chosen? And again, it doesn't matter what order I choose the five students in. I'll still have the same representation on the committee. So order does not matter here, so I'm going to do a combination. And again, this one, it's the combination. There are 20 students, and five of them are chosen. Always the, the total versus how many are being chosen, so it's always the larger number first. And again, that's a job for my calculator. I plug it in. It gives me the 15,504. Uh, the next one, a restaurant offers uh, six different uh, entree items. 
uh, eight side dishes and four dessert options. If uh, customers are allowed to choose one of each of these things, so one entree, one side, one dessert, how many different meal options are possible? This is my fundamental counting principle. I basically say, hey, if there's six options for this and eight options for this and four options for this, the total number of possibilities, I multiply those. And uh, when I multiply those, I get a 192. Okay, but that's my fundamental counting principle. Okay. Uh, here, probability and odds. Uh, remember, probability is how uh, the what we want over the total. Odds is what we want versus what we don't want. Okay. So here, the probability of a number less than four on a standard number cube. Uh, there are three numbers that are less than four. That are six total options on the number cube. So the answer here is a one half. All right. Uh, this one, if we look at letters A through L, uh, that is twelve uh, letters. And that's going to be important for this thing. Uh, we want to know the odds of selecting a vowel. So vowels are A, E, uh, I are the only ones that fall between A and L. Okay, And so the, the odds of selecting a vowel is 3. So probability would be 3 out of 12, but odds is what we want versus what we don't want. There's 3 vowels. There's 9 other letters, so it's 3 to 9. And then I have to reduce that. That's 1 to 3. And remember, we always do ex express odds in this kind of ratio format. Uh, the next one, a bag contains 25 red, 55 blue, and 60 white checkers. Uh, if a checker is selected at random, what is the probability that the checker, checker is not blue? And so I would probably think of it this way. I would say, okay, well, blue is, is uh, 55 out of, uh, there's 140 listed. So then, again, that would be blue. So then not blue is everything else. I say, okay, so instead of 55 out of the 140, it would be 85 out of the 140. And then I have to reduce that fraction. And again, you could add up all the things that are not blue and, and approach it that way. Or you can say, well, blue is 55 out of 140, so not blue is everything else, 85 out of 140. Okay. Uh, this one, a hat contains 12 spheres and 8 cubes. If an object is selected at random and then replaced, what is the probability that you select a sphere and then a cube? So we're picking it out and putting it back, so the sphere would be 12 out of 20. I pick out a sphere, I put it back in. Now the cube is 8, still out of 20, because I put that sphere back in. And uh, the word then, uh, well, the word and is there, but and means we multiply these probabilities. And again, when you're multiplying, I would always simplify the fractions first. So here that becomes a 3 out of 5. Here that becomes a 2 out of 5. And now I can multiply straight across numerator times the numerator, denominator times the denominator. So it looks like I get 6 out of... Uh, 25. Okay? But again, and is multiply or is add. Okay? Um, students tend to get those mixed up. The next one, we're doing it without replacement this time, so that makes a little bit of a difference. Without replacement, we have to use our imaginations just a little bit more. So we want a, uh, a blue marble and then a white marble. So I say, okay, the probability of the, uh, the blue marble would be 12. Sorry, I accidentally selected the wrong color there. It's a little hard to read would be 12 out of uh, 24. The word then implies the word and, so I'm going to multiply, but I don't have to use my imagination. Imagine that I've taken out one of those blue marbles. Now there's still four white marbles uh, in the jar, but there's only 23 marbles total because I removed one of the blue marbles. Okay, And now I'm going to simplify this thing. Again, I reduce each fraction first. That's a 1 over 2. Uh, I could also reduce the... Uh, um, the, the 2 and the 4, because remember, when you're multiplying, you can cross-reduce. Uh, that's a 2 over 1. And now I can multiply straight across on this thing. Uh, that gives me a 2 uh, out of uh, 23, it looks like. Okay? Uh, this one, red, then red. Uh, again, the word then implies the word and, but red would be 8 out of 24. Uh, but now, using my imagination, I take one red out. Now there's only 7 red marbles left. There's only 23 total marbles left, and now I'm going to multiply. Okay, so again, reduce. That's 1 over 3. And I don't think anything else reduces here, so I multiply straight across. That gives me a 7 out of uh, 69. Uh, the next one, both white. And so on this one, again, same kind of thing. The word saying, uh, you know, both white is like I want a white one and then a white one. Uh, and so it implies the word and there. Uh, so it's 4 out of 24 for the first one. Uh, but now there's only 3 left if I take one out and don't put it back. There's only 23 total marbles left. 
and I'm going to multiply. And again, I reduce this thing before I multiply. Um, I can reduce the, the 6 and the 3 as well to a 1 and a 2. And now I multiply straight across. That gives me a 1 over uh, 46. Okay. Uh, the next one, uh, odds against red. So now odds for red would be 8 to uh, 16. It's what we want versus what we don't want. But odds against, I list what I don't want first. So the, the stuff that's not red, there's 16 of them. The things that are red is the 8. Okay, so odds against red is kind of like saying odds of not red. So not red is 16, red is 8. And now I have to reduce this. That's a 2 to 1. Okay? But again, that slight difference between odds and probability. Uh, this one, a class has 15 girls and 10 boys. Uh, five of the boys and seven of the girls are wearing black shirts. The rest are wearing orange shirts. If one is selected ram, what's the probability uh, that they are a girl? Or uh, they're wearing an orange shirt and orange shirt. Sorry, a little bit of a typo there. Okay. Um, so when you look at something like this guy, the thing that makes this a little bit tricky uh, is there's some overlap here and there's a lot of information. So when you think about the, the 15 girls, we kind of separate it out this way and then the, uh, the 10 boys, um, you think about the breakdown here in terms of the girls, there are, uh, sorry, uh, seven girls that are wearing a black shirt, which means there's eight girls that are wearing an orange shirt. Um, then uh, for the boys, uh, there's five that are wearing a black shirt. Uh, there must be five that are wearing an orange shirt. Okay, and so now that we have all that information, probability that we have a that we're going to get a, a girl out of this thing that would be 15 out of 25 because that's what there is. The or means we add, uh, and then an orange shirt. We just have to look at the orange shirts. Well, when you look at orange shirts, it looks like there's a total of uh, 13 who are wearing orange shirts out of 25. Uh, but then we have to subtract the overlap. All the girls that are wearing orange shirts got counted twice, so I have to subtract that 8 out of 25. Okay. So anytime we have overlap, uh, you know, we have to subtract that uh, because we're, we're essentially going to be counting those things twice each time. All right. And so when I do this, that gives me a 20 out of 25. Um, sorry, that was, that was terrible. I have well, myself right in the 5. And now I reduce this thing, and that reduces to a 4 over 5. And that's it. So again, when there's overlap, make sure you subtract the overlap. And in this one, this one's really more of a rating problem than is anything else. It says the teacher places the, the names of 50 students in a hat. The teacher pulls names at random without replacing them uh, to create groups of 7 students. You are one of the 50 students and are not selected in the first group. Uh, what is the probability that you are the first student selected uh, for the second group? And so when you think about the situation, we started with 50 uh, kids. Uh, we've already selected 7 students, so there's only 43 students left in this thing. And you're one of them. So the, the probability that you're selected next is 1 out of 43. And that's it. Okay. I uh, hope this was helpful. Make sure you uh, study for the flashback uh, section, and uh, good luck on your test.